There was a survey done by Economist Intellectual Magazine. This was back in 2012. And they said that 70% of all international ventures fail because of cultural differences. You know, when you travel to Japan, it's a big deal to to bow out of respect and how low you bow and how you present them a business card. Really important. If you don't do it right, you're offending somebody. And in China, for example, when you enter a meeting, you know, as a salesperson, you present something and you're used to asking for yeses, you know, on a trial close. Well, what do you, you know, did did you like the product? Uh, This will work for you, right? You want them to say yes. But in China, when somebody responds yes, they're actually just saying they understand. They heard you. They're not saying, yes, I want, I, I love your proposal. The digital age has actually disrupted corporate cultures or, or perhaps, Robert, it's um, made it to where you you have to have a set policy or something to uh, deal with um, on, not an in-demand, but automatic uh, displays of culture, right? We cannot really have a corporate culture, okay, in a global company, okay? We can have some elements of a corporate culture, but we cannot dictate micro issues in the in this digital global age. Basically, a strong culture acknowledges that the most critical asset of a company is its people, and protecting its people is one of the surest ways for the continued success of corporations. In order to get the most out of people, you have to look at it you're dealing with different countries and so you have to look at it from their perspective and what's important for for them and their beliefs and their values and we have to be respectful of that cultural intelligence or cq would be the capability to function effectively across a variety of cultural context whether it's ethnic generational and organizational cultures Hi, welcome back, uh, everybody. This is episode 12 of the New World of Work podcast. Uh, The topic today will be on corporate cultures in the digital age. And uh, we're very excited to talk about this. This is such a key topic for um, organizations today of any type. This this works for for for-profit businesses, um, small businesses, mom and pops, uh, large corporations, nonprofits and governmental organizations. So the the idea of um, helping cor- helping the workforce, the people that work for an organization uh, interact with each other towards a successful outcome is a huge uh, competitive advantage. And today we have with us the author of uh, this chapter in our book, um, Corporate Cultures in the Digital Age, uh, Dr. Robert Ramirez. And uh, we're, we're fortunate to have you to do this, uh, Robert. I understand you have a uh, doc. Your doctorate is in this area. Is that correct? It's actually in, in international business, but this is such a big part of international business that it it was worked into uh, uh, my dissertation as well. Awesome. So, so we really are going to talk about um, just three very quick questions on this. Uh, we. Uh, we look forward to later doing a, a, a much deeper dive into this. But um, for today's podcast, we're going to look at uh, what corporate culture is, how the digital age has disrupted corporate cultures, and how cultural intelligence uh, can be the key to thriving in this digital age. So, uh, Robert, why don't you start us off by telling us what corporate culture is? <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Let me, let me start with three steps. First of all, you know, if you were to take a look at the office, you'd see a plethora of diverse individuals working together while also working from diverse locations, such as the houses uh, that, that we live in, or even different countries, or across the different states. But we're all striving towards a common mission. So that's, that's number one. Number two is the most important aspects of all companies are its people. Without the employees, there wouldn't there would be no ideas. There wouldn't be the creation of intellectual properties, uh, patents, trademarks, 
uh, brands. So basically, no new products would be designed and no orders would be fulfilled without people. So, so now that we recognize that people is our most important asset, as we've been saying so much in this book, we got to think about culture. And culture is, is the intensely rooted pattern of values, customs, attitudes, and beliefs that distinguish one group of people from another group of people. And the foundation of every organization is the company's culture. So basically, a strong culture acknowledges that the most critical asset of a company is its people, and protecting its people is one of the surest ways for the continued success of corporations. And, and Dr. Bob, uh, the term common sense, what do you think common sense has to do with culture? I'm going to give you a story. Get ready. Hold on to your horses. <laughs> I was vice president of human resources for Maxtor disk drive company in the Silicon Valley. Maxtor was at that time a worldwide corporation with 15,000 employees. Our manufacturing operations. This is a very interesting story. So Maxtor was most manufacturing. They had moved their manufacturing to Asia, Hong Kong, and Singapore. The biggest manufacturing plant was in Singapore in an area called Anmokyo. I was instrumental in setting up the plant in Singapore. Now, our headquarters office is in San Jose, California. I'm sitting in my headquarters office one fine day, morning, hmm. about mid-morning, a, a white female employee comes into my office, closes the door and reads me the riot act. Hmm? And her a complaint was, have you seen, using my real name, says, have you seen the latest employee house magazine? I said, yes, I have. Do you realize that there's a picture of these women in our Singapore operations having a swimsuit contest during the Christmas party? And they take pictures of the swimsuit, these female employees in Singapore, swimsuit and having a, Miss Max Store Singapore contest oh boy. during the Christmas party. What kind of a culture are you espousing in this company which exploits female? I said, boy, this is in Singapore. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't matter. We are a worldwide company. What kind of a culture that allows exploitation of the female Form. Hmm. So, in Singapore, Dr. Ramirez, this is common practice, okay? These female uh, assembly workers look forward to the company Christmas party and they plan it for a year. Aha. Uh -huh. It is part of their culture. Sure. It is part of their culture. Now, this female who came to complain is saying that Maxtor should have a worldwide culture with standards from the West. Hmm? So I talked to the HR people in Singapore, said, Bob, this is part of our tradition. They look forward to this. And we don't have that many issues with a exploitation women as you guys have in America. Hmm? So why are you imposing American cultural values to us? Good point. So that is a real life definition of corporate culture. Okay. Hmm? From the real world. Hmm? Yeah. So I was put in a position of being a judge. How would you have handled this situation? That's a very tricky question uh, because it, it really is like uh, Robert was saying that co corporate culture is the collection of all the beliefs and values and uh, there there's huge accountability um, from uh, what are they watchdog groups and those types of things. 
um, within America right now. And so to have, uh, a, you know, how can you set culture? How can you control culture? How these are all the collection of all these um, beliefs. So, Robert, what, what's your answer to that? Well, in order to get the most out of people, you have to look at it. You know, you're dealing with different countries, and so you have to look at it from their perspective and what's important for, for, for them and their beliefs and their values. And we have to be respectful of that. So, it, you know, I believe that you have to... Uh, take a take a step back. Look at look at it from their perspective, and then make a decision. Yeah. But here's so, a challenge, Bob. Mm -hmm. As corporate vice, global vice president of human resources, and we have a single employee magazine, right, for the whole worldwide operation. Singapore people wanted those the Christmas party highlighted in the magazine. Mm -hmm. So the publishers. Uh, this is a, by the way, employee managed publication we had. Okay? Got it. HR department wasn't responsible. A group of employee committee members decided what stories go into the magazine every month. Okay. So my feeling is this is a topic that cannot be defined as if it's designed in a laboratory in a dehumidified atmosphere of a laboratory, you know, ra or rather it is, has to be designed in the real world and buffeted around from case to case, okay? We cannot really have a corporate culture, okay, in a global company, okay? We can have some elements of a corporate culture, but we cannot dictate micro issues in the in this digital global age. Yeah, I, and and you're talking about a magazine that was distributed to the within the company. Um, but what we've seen with the digital age, uh, this fourth industrial revolution, is that there's this hyper connectivity, right? So uh, I could see it. We, we have within our organization, uh, Facebook actually provides a social media platform within an organization. And so that, uh, that swimsuit um, edition or, or whatever, <laughs> what you're calling it, could show up on um, the workplace app, uh, the social media app uh, immediately. And there's not a necessarily a, a editing process to what pictures go up. And so that's one example, I think, of how the digital age has actually disrupted corporate cultures or or perhaps robert it's um made it to where you you have to have a set policy or something to uh deal with um on not an in demand but automatic uh displays of culture right so what other ways has the digital age disrupted corporate cultures well let's good question so let's take a step back so First of all, the digital age that we live in now, you know, we're calling it the fourth industrial revolution. So the digital age, it's, how, it's actually marked by the amount of information that we have access to that's so widely available. So it's primarily through computer technology. So we, we have all this information at our, at our fingertips. So basically, you know, what we're saying is, you know, the global leaders, they, they have to be skilled managers and they're the critical to the interconnected economy uh, and implementing our complex business process. And what Dr. Bob described was he had a complex business process of, of the newsletter for the company, how to handle that. So all that has to be uh, uh, navigated. So I, I think too, culturally, like from a leadership standpoint, it's one thing to be caught by surprise and have to react, right? Yeah. Uh, but it's another for the same thing to happen twice. Uh, I was the part of the Human Resource Executive Council, which is senior shown, all the senior most HR people in the Silicon Valley, Bay Area, 
they have an association called the Bay Area Human Resource Executives Council, okay? And the president of that particular year was a lady called Nancy. Mm -hmm. She called me up, and I at that time I was Chief Human Resource Officer for Maxto. She called me up and says, Hey, Bob, we have a committee assignment for you. I said, okay. Yeah, yeah, are you willing? I yes, said, okay, I, any committee that you assign me, you're the president, I'm willing. Says, But there's a twist to this committee. The committee has one member only. It's you. So <laughs> you're the president of this committee. <laughs> you as the member. I said, what the hell is this committee about? Is... The committee is about telling your countrymen who work in the Silicon Valley, all IT programmers and all, which are many, many of them, okay? Mm -hmm. Silicon Valley is full of in programmers from India. The uh, employees are complaining in our companies about these guys from India having BO. <laughs> okay. BO, body odor, right? Mm -hmm. And you have been chartered as a committee member to figure out how to advise these people because this culturally is offensive to others. Now, the reason why these Indian programmers of BO, they bring these curries and all the Indian cooking, which are very as heavy mm -hmm. smell factor, and they cook their... I heat up the lunches in the cafeteria cup mm, microwaves and it smells the whole place up. Mm. Plus they have this lingering curry smell in their bodies. Mm -hmm. well, they, that's their cultural trait of eating their Indian curries. And they're an integral part of the high-tech company programmers, right? So what do you, we how do we smooth out these cultural differences is the question. Exactly. I, I also want to point out to that, Bob, is that there was a survey done by e Economist and Intellectual Magazine. Yeah. This was back in 2012. And they said that 70% of all international ventures fail because of cultural differences. Think about that. 70%. And, you know, what happens is, you know, in, in a big company, we're hiring managers that might be located, as you said, in, in India or product developers in China or research development in Poland and customer service in, in the Philippines and assembly in Mexico. So we, when we walk into a meeting and you, we're dealing with that diverse community to answer your question, we have to, we have to prepare ourselves. And you have to understand your audience and you should do a little bit of homework to understand who's going to be there and, and, and the cultures that they come from. A, a couple little examples that come to my head, you know, when you, know, you, when you travel to Japan, it's a big deal to, to bow out of respect and how low you bow and how you present them a business card. Really important. And if you don't do it right, you're offending somebody. And in China, for example, when you enter a meeting, you know, as a salesperson, you present something and you're used to asking for yeses, you know, on a trial close. Well, what do you, you know, did, did you like the product? Uh, this will work for you, right? You want them to say yes. But in China, when somebody responds yes, they're actually just saying they understand. They heard you. They're not saying, yes, I want, I, I love your proposal. So it's really different. And our leaders, managers, really under, need to spend some time to learn what we're calling now CQ, which is cultural intelligence. It's really important. Yeah, I think I think what what you're attempting to do is, uh, as the leadership of an organization, your goal is to meet organizational goals to get productivity. Right. And all managers are taught when you face obstacles. Uh, especially American culture. When you face an obstacle, you you blow it up, right? You you run through it and blow it up. And American culture is is very egocentric, and so we will um, have people say things like, "Well, those people in those other countries just need to get with what the way our company runs, and they need to follow our American values." And uh, we 
we don't understand the disrespect that that is giving to those individuals. Uh, this is this is just one part of culture is eth- eth- uh, country differences or mm-hmm. um, cultural differences there. But if we were, say, uh, an employee here in America to a foreign um, company and they just dismiss our practices and, uh, you know, we come around to the 4th of July or, or Christmas and those are traditional holidays for us to take off and they expect us to work. Uh, it, it would really bother us, you know, because these are uh, key traditions here in America. Right. <clears throat> right. The, the, see, the way I see it in a, from a conceptual big picture point of view is there is a corporate culture which is set by the leaders of the company of how, to, how they are going to lead the company, various aspects of leadership. Uh, which is whether it's going to be industrial democracy, engagement, empowerment, all of those broad macro issues. Then are uh, then there are micro cultural issues, which are come come ab- come about because of the digital age and the global global nature of most companies. Has nothing to do with the corporate cultural issues, which are broad macro issues of how the company communicates, how decision making is made, whether there is industrial democracy or empowerment and engagement. People leaders is to come up with an amalgam- amalgamation of these two approaches to corporate cultures to develop the right corporate cultural intelligence for the company. <clears throat> Robert, what are some other forms of differences, corporate differences? You talked about ethnicities or, or things like that. Well, here is a big here is a big thing within within understanding people's culture. Let me talk about about uh, racism. How all all of us are are biased against people. I would. It is a fact that one hundred percent of us are biased. We all have biased tendencies. So we have to be aware of those biased tendencies. And those biased tendencies arise because maybe perhaps how you were brought up, where you were born. As children, we had no choice about where we were born, right? Whether we were born in the U.S., California, or maybe India, or Pakistan, or Russia. There was no choice. And you grew culturally depending on your parents and your environment that you, that you grew in and the religion. So we have to be aware of that. In a corporation, in a corporate uh, entity, so the definition is a little bit different. So cultural intelligence or CQ would be the capability to function effectively across a variety of cultural contexts, whether it's ethnic, generational, and organizational cultures. So in the book, you know, we actually talk about that in more detail. We actually provide a roadmap about CQ and uh, we we give examples of how to resolve our biases, how to slow down our, our fast brain, our quick reaction, so that we can think more rationally, and then how to come up with a plan to uh, to check our CQ learning and what we know and, and our drive to know more about cultures and the strategy that we would go into uh, before having a meeting that had many people from many countries. So we get into this in the book, and that's why we wanted to introduce this as our, as our topic. And I will have to say that when we are intentional with our corporate culture, using cultural intelligence will serve our people well. So when people feel... Oh, go ahead, Bill. I didn't mean to cut you off. Dr. Bob. The question I brought up, uh, talk about from a macro and micro sense. Mm-hmm. Macro sense, I, I, it seems to me cultural intelligence is a macro concept. It's a top-down concept. What the leaders want as the culture of the company, you know, how decision-making is made, how communication systems are built, you know, how people interact. Mm-hmm from a top-down basis. 
But then the, there is a set of microcultures which multi-ethnic workforces bring to the workplace, okay? And especially nowadays and in the digital age and in the global environment, there are many, many microcultural issues mm -hmm. that also has to be, people have to be aware of and be sensitive towards, okay, their fellow workers and how culturally different they behave. Behaving on a cultural CQ, we are talking about a top-down culture, which doesn't necessarily connect with these micro-mini cultures of ethnic diverse workplaces. So, in your opinion, does the cultural CQ deal with the, a wide variety of microcultures that are, that are, that become part of the corporate culture? Sure. Well, corporate culture, it's the overall arching umbrella over everything. And then, you know, that's, that, that's where we are at the macro level. And you're correct, as we drill down, you're getting into the CQ, the, the cultural intelligence and, and CQ part of it. And then it goes, you know, you can drill down much deeper than that to start talking about uh, all the attitudes and beliefs and also, you know, biases that, that everybody has. Yeah, I, I think I think in, in listening to this, uh, we have a corporate culture that is uh, decisions that the top management has made. Uh, those could be either reactionary um, fixing issues as they arise or, or as Dr. Bob was mentioned earlier, being a judge on what is the right and wrong behavior. Uh, top management can also set corporate culture intentionally where it's more of a positive. Let's, let's add new um, celebrations and let's add new things. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then we we're talking about just the cultural intelligence in two aspects of this. I'm, I'm just in the example of the ethnicity, you could have uh, myself needing to be uh, culturally intelligent to the differences that I have with people that are from a different culture. But simultaneously, I need to step up from my own culture and say, these are the things that are important to me. These are the things that are not, not so important to me. Right. And so to have this uh, fair exchange of um, really, really uh, saying, this is what I believe is, is true for me. And this is how I show respect in um, understanding your culture. What I have done, uh, Bob and Bill, as head of HR in the Silicon Valley, which is very monthly ethnic, very diverse, okay? I have annual, I had annual cultural, cultural sensitivity events. I forgot what I call them, gave them a fancy branding. And we opened up the cafeteria to bring, to let all our ethnic groups bring their own food hmm, and share it with each other. Hmm. Fantastic. Then we had another event where to build this microcultural awareness, we had to have everybody wear their national costumes and come to work. Yeah, excellent. Hmm. And so they, at the, at the micro level, people started talking about each other's cultures. So there is some, sensitivity understanding being built from the bottom up okay mm -hmm. so google is very famous in doing this right now and the one of the companies that they do all these events okay google cafeteria serves the gourmet cook they serve i'm told 25 different cuisine cultural cuisines okay so the all the cultures of Google, when they go to the cafeteria, they, they, they are sensitized that there are people from other cultures also working along with them and they you eat differently and their food is available in the cafeteria. This is a culture, this company, Google, has figured out a way to, ha to handle cultural, uh, what do you call that? intelligence, both at the macro and the micro yeah. level. 
Okay, that is why Google is quite often in the great best places to work survey on the top 10 today, these days. The more and more companies, because of the multi ethnicity and diversity, inclusion, and equity programs, they need to have these events in house so to make employees aware of the cultural differences in their ethnic uh, ethnic com employee compositions okay yep so robert what are your closing thoughts on this topic well th that was a good example to close with um uh, dr bob but so basically what we're saying is when people feel that they are seen and they are understood <laughs> that they contribute to a much higher uh, degree within the company so people need so leadership has to get the most out of its people and understanding their cultures and their background and having events like you just described is is uh very much in the right going in the right direction and i applaud google for doing that yeah so it sounds like investing in cultural intelligence at all levels um is well worth it well, thank you both again. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, again, remember to like, comment, and subscribe to our YouTube channel and give us uh, five-star reviews on uh, Apple Podcasts and on Spotify Podcast. Uh, thank you again for both of you joining us today, and we'll see you guys uh, next time. Thank you. Thank you. See you next time. Bye-bye.